posted. Again, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for the uh, morning uh, Soto service and also the Dharma talk. Today, the, we have the pleasure of uh, listening to Unsun Sengaku Dan Jocelyn. Uh, Sensei Sengaku Dan Jocelyn is the Silent Thunder Order novice. He's not a novice priest now. He actually just, we need to update your bio, sir. I pulled this offline. So he's actually a fully transmitted um, priest that he went through his uh, Susho ceremony last year, 2020. Um, so we're um, going to update that, but he is a practice. Uh, Mokyo is also his practice um, leader of uh, the Falmouth Sangha, but he is the actual, the guiding teacher of the Falmouth Sangha um, up in, in Massachusetts. Sensei um, also works with drug and alcohol counseling and engaging senior citizens in learning meditation. He is available to speak and uh, to speak on the history of Buddhism and Zen and their role in everyday life. Please, uh, with the Big God Show, welcome Sensei Sengaku, Dan Jocelyn. Um, he's going to be speaking with us this uh, morning about change. And uh, again, we are so um, welcome to have him. And I want to give also uh, Hojo Sensei the opportunity to say if there are any other items that you wanted to say about uh, Sensei uh, Dan Jocelyn. Uh, Sengaku was uh, here in Atlanta for many years, I don't know how long, with his wife, who is a Susan, who is a psychiatrist. And uh, they retired, partially retired, and moved to Falmouth. Um, and I've been up there, I think, once, once or twice. I was up there in time for a big hurricane. One time that was fun. And um, he was our prototype. Uh, we'd, we'd, we'd helped several startups up until that point, but we'd never done it as kind of a considered process. So with Sangak, knowing his retirement and moving to Falmouth, uh, was coming up, we put together sort of the prototypical, how do you start up a new Zen center? And uh, he is the, um, he and I worked on that together, but um, Sangak made it all happen. And we developed the basic approach uh, for anyone who's gone through training to start up a new group. And his, I think, was the quickest, the most successful, the least problematic. He may differ with me on that. But um, of all of the ones that we have tried in the past, several of which have failed, by the way. But uh, we now have a fully functioning uh, center in Falmouth. And any of us who are traveling up that way to the Northeast Coast, I'm sure you'd be welcome to join them. And so with that, I'd like to welcome Sangak. Sangak means the three teachings. He may be telling you more about the meaning of his name. Thank you, Fusat. Thanks, uh, Sensei. I'd like to begin by saying happy Founders Month to everyone. Um, Founders Month is um, a wonderful event. Um, not so sure I would say it's the most important event, but it's like a car. What is the most important part of a car? Uh, tires, engine, so forth and so on. Founders Month is integral to what we do. It is integral to us as an order Mokurai or Silent Under Order. It's integral to what we do in terms of our understanding of ancestors and lineage. It is a vital component of those things that we celebrate each year in the Silent Under Order. So my talk today, and by the way, I placed something in the chat, which is an earlier Dharma talk I gave several weeks ago um, to our Sangha looking at the uh, interrelationship of the Falmouth Soto Zen Sangha going all the way back to uh, Sakyamuni Buddha. It's not long, so don't worry. And kind of going through the different stages we've gone through. So uh, for those of you in Atlanta, uh, Fusats, if you would be kind enough to make that available uh, to people who are not on uh, Zoom, uh, I would appreciate it. Yep, and, so, and since they, I will do that, I will link that to the talk today, and also sure. we'll put it on the website. And before you get started, can we do the beginning opening Dharma verse? I always forget that, but I just want to get, get allow you to do that. Of course, today. of course. Bells, please. Do you want to do it? No, go ahead. Okay.
the unsurpassed, profound, and wondrous Dharma is rarely met with even in a hundred thousand million kalpas. Now we can see and hear it, accept and maintain it. May we unfold the meaning of the Tathagata's truth. Consider everything I said before the Tathagata's truth to be true. I was talking a little bit about um, last time I spoke uh, to Atlanta was in September of last year. So it's been about 14 months. Uh, Atlanta was very involved um, actually uh, in November of last year when we had two major events in our uh, Sangha. One was um, Moko Nancy Sherwood took um, Taike Tokido, became a disciple and then four months later became practice leader as Fusats mentioned. I still function as a guiding teacher. It is very interesting to me that um, we have come so far and looking at Hojo, I think I've come a very little way. Looking at Hojo, I realize how far he's come. I realize without him that I wouldn't be here today, nor would any of you. Simple as that. As a result of that, I have developed, I think, really in the last couple of years, a great affinity for ancestors and the meaning of our lineage and our ancestors. And so does in Buddhism. And of course, I gravitate to Masaoka Roshi and his teaching since 1939 for us in the US and to uh, Hojo Michael Elliston Roshi for his carrying on of that teaching. It was in 2007 that 2006 when uh, Hojo uh, published both books about the teachings of Matsuoka Roshi and uh, the Kawasaku and the Mokurai. And in that book, in the introduction, he talks about the importance of doing so. And one of the things he says very poignantly is, I wanted this to be archival. I wanted this to be what my teacher said from what I remember. It's like an Ananda-like statement. As you recall, Ananda was gifted with the ability to understand each word spoken by the world honored one by Sakyamuni Buddha. And in the introduction, um, Hojo mentions that. It's most important because as you read both books, you see a rather direct ability to interpret something from Japanese to English that is so viable. And a result of that simplistic language, I think has rubbed off I think it's rubbed off on Hojo, by the way, in, in his wonderful new book. But I think it's rubbed off on many of us that follow his teachings. As a matter of fact, Matsuroka Roshi said, it is the simplicity of this one to another, this sharing one to another, simple, direct, silent mountain sitting, boom, boom, there. With the establishment of the Silent Thunder Order in 2010, uh, Hojo established uh, two things of importance. One is the order itself. We are of the order when we take Zaikai Tokudo. When we become a disciple, we are a disciple in the order of Buddha named Mokurai or Silent Thunder. Secondly, there is an affiliate, an affiliation that we have of people who are not in Atlanta. And this is referred to as affiliate sanghas. An affiliate sangha, by our general definition, and this varies and is under some review, is a person who leads a particular sitting group, sangha, center, 
who has been taught by someone who has been transmitted in the silent thunder order. Transmitted means a fully transmitted priest, someone taking uh, Shiho. I want you to understand the gravity of that. 95% of all individuals that have taken Tokido, maybe more like 97%, maybe even a little bit higher, have had a Hojo-san as the guiding teacher. Let that sink in for a moment. There are only two now sinners other than Atlanta that have transmitted priests. Zenku, Jerry Smyers, and Dayton, Montana, Mission Mountain Zen, and our Sangha with me as its guiding teacher in Falmouth, Massachusetts. The weight, importance, and unshakable approach that Hojo has taken in this regard is beyond laudable. Some five years ago, a re recommendation was made that uh, the month of November be put aside as a month of consideration. A month of consideration for our ancestors and our lineage, primarily a way of going back and looking at the teachings of Matsuoka Roshi more thoroughly. There were suggestions made by the Silent Thunder Order board of directors that a series of things could be done, but it was left up to each individual practice leader in a Sangha to say how they might want to celebrate with all of us in an asymmetrical way, uh, the meaning of our root teacher, the meaning of the person who made it all possible. I'm going to be talking about change today, and most of my talk about change is going to focus on wayfinding. A wayfinding talk is when, oh, someone taking Jukai or Zaikai, Shikai, Shikai, or uh, have been Shusho or taken Shiho, uh, speak to a congregation about how they got there. How did you get there from here? Well, those of you who are not, in the Northeast, I will give you a koan. So this guy walks up to this Mainer, the Mainer is somebody from Maine, and says, how do I get to this place from here? And the Mainer says, you can't get there from here. Now, a few years ago, I came up with a commentary on that. You can't get there from here. So my commentary is, however, if you go over yonder, you can get there from there. So I know all of you will be up late tonight and feel free to call Hojo if you want a thorough investigation or Moko or Moku, Moku. You can't get there from here, but if you go over yonder, you might be able to get there from there. The idea of change. In the original frontier, Hojo talks about the permanence of impermanence or the interconnectivity as being impermanent. And I would add to that, what happens when you are at the crossroads of impermanence and interrelatedness? I suggest to you that that is being time, Uji. The crossroads of impermanence and inter R, interrelatedness. Change is our perspective, as Hojo points out in the original frontier. It's our perception of what is happening. Later in his book, or earlier in his book, he talks about his dad's uh, looking at 
the idea of change, and I can appreciate it now as I've grown older. He said it was like being on a merry-go-round. And all of a sudden, it's getting faster and faster. Now, I seem to remember when, as I was young that the speed of the merry-go-round was second only to the speed of light. I thought it was a fast thing. But I do remember it taking it in my stride that it seemed nothing particular. Yet, the last time I was on one of those things, it was a small one and it was going mighty fast. So this leads me to what I refer to as the three leaving homes. If continuity is a byproduct of the crossroads or the intersection of impermanence and interconnectivity, we in the process of impermanence and interconnectivity also celebrate continuity. But this continuity is different from what I would refer to as a relay race, where someone passes a baton from one to another. The baton baton is lifeless. It has nothing in of itself other than a placid connectivity between runners seeking a record. However, for us as practitioners, it is seminal. During my week of Shiho, I had to several times a day recite our male lineage and female lineage. It became rhythmical. The names became somewhat familiar, although I have to confess to all of you, my short-term memory now is not what it used to be. And I'm finding that Japanese is not one of my strengths in terms of remembering how things are said. But in that process, these were not wooden batons. These were not people that were non-existent, but rather existed when I simply called out their name. Just as if I call out my mother's name, I see her, I remember her, I have a sense of her. How does this become instilled, you might ask, in us? It doesn't. We find it just as we find the other things in Zen. It is not by looking, but by being open. Shamata, awareness of awareness. When we are though, thus, such, in Mo, it is quite different. It's like the ancestors are running with us, right beside us. Something's out, something out of chariots of fire. Those of you remembering that old movie. Ojo mentions change 103 times in the original frontier. Now, I didn't count them, but this is a wonderful thing about having Kindle. I can pop Kindle in there and it shows up 103 times. Wonderful in the way that that works. In Kawasaku, Oroshi mentions cause and effect six times and has an entire chapter on cause and effect. One of the things he said, and I'll say this first, and I'll go back to a technique that um, Hojo uh, Ellison Roshi used. He said he referred to his understanding as original nature, the original nature. In some ways, original nature is different from human nature or Buddha nature. Buddha nature is a perspective and we refer it to it and it is a teaching means, but even that has to drop away in our ultimate understanding of our understanding. Original nature. In Hojo's book, he explored 
that original nature. There was a technique that Hojo used in Mokurai where he underlined certain words. I must confess I hadn't noticed that until a recent reading. One of the words that were underlined several times was this, which reminds me of one of the stories that Hojo likes to share about Oroshi. When asked, what does this mean? He would oftentimes say, it depends. Or what is this? An answer might be, it depends. Conditions and variables are about their work. And the work that they are about is non-permanence on a micro level, which means change. But that might be oscillation, vibration. Each of the eyes, each of the khandas, skandhas have their own way of being aware. So as we look at the three different kinds of leaving home, I suggest I left home with Jukai. I left home because when I took Jukai, I acknowledged five vows, which made me somewhat different. And I left home, but not physically, but in terms of my awareness. There was a second leaving home when I left Atlanta for Falmouth in 2010. I'd been in Atlanta studying with uh, Hojo for five years and then uh, moved to Falmouth, as Hojo pointed out, in terms of a retirement function. I, I gathered my last paycheck at 71, so I didn't quite retire. My wife is retiring this coming March, uh, and she's a little bit older than 71. My third leaving home was when I took Shuso. When I became transmitted, I was no longer relating primarily to the expectations and overarching teaching of my teacher. Rather, my appreciation, thankfulness is even more. But now, I am in Falmouth now. Just as Hojo left Chicago for Atlanta and Oroshi left Chicago for Long Beach and just as Bodhidharma left India for China. We all go through these moments. One moment this, one moment that. A football player who was recently uh, traded from one football team to another said, I went to sleep on a team that was four and four and woke up on a team that was seven and one. So I wanna to talk to you about not only leaving home and being in this place that I am now, but to give a kind of a wayfaring talk about our Sangha. Sensei's always been very kind with um, talking about how, how we set up, actually he and I set up and talked about for a couple of years, the implications of the growth of the teachings of Matsuroka Roshi. When I received um, Zaikei Tokudo, we did not have a silent thunder order as such. But here in Atlanta, we do. Here in Falmouth, we do. In Jacksonville, we do. In Dayton, we do. Chattanooga, we do. So I wanna to talk to you just about one Sangha, Falmouth, Soto, Zen, Sangha, and what we have become and how it relates back to everything we've talked about relative to, if I wasn't here, the people from Falmouth on this 
Zoom talk would not be either. So the Falmouth Soto Zen Sangha was also founded in November. So we celebrate our founders month celebration, founding of our Sangha and the founding of my order of Moko's order, of everyone's order. It is a wonderful time. And I'm sure you might have noticed that it is in the month of November, which has something called Thanksgiving. It's a month of gratitude. Although for those of you who come up to visit sometimes in November, we'll take you to the Wampanoag parade in Plymouth, which is quite different from the Plymouth parade regarding Plymouth Rock. My point is that this Sangha, like all Sanghas, has evolved over the last 11 years now. We've done many things and have gone down several roads. We had to turn around and come back. And um, I don't think the Sangha made any mistakes, but I know I have. So our Sangha, the Falmouth Soto Zen Sangha, I think of us as a boundless center in the sense that our, our evolution has not been to establish a physical center. Cost prohibits that. We are a small uh, congregation, Sangha, 10 people upwards to 14 maybe. And we have been in only one location for 10 years. Now we're in our second more central to the city of Falmouth. Uh, our accommodations are equal to what we had. Uh, and we are in a welcome place and are able to do the things we did before. But it is new for us. We're going through that change as well. We're going through the change of a practice leader, someone other than me for, for a while. And as a result of that, my role as guiding teacher now is to develop our practice path to follow the guidance of my teacher and do so in a way that will enable the different roles we play as a Sangha and my roles as a teacher to be fulfilled. So we are about Sangha teaching and outreach, Sangha. Our Sangha is very interesting. We're men and women, about 50-50. And in our approach to Jukai, uh, each person has about 10 months of training with Jukai. And we have a practice path set up for just Jukai training. Pretty straightforward. And we'll have our uh, our 13th Jukai on uh, November 20th. At that time, everyone currently involved with the exception of one wonderful guy has taken Jukai. So in this regard, we adhere to pretty much the practice path that has been laid out by hojo -san. In this regard, the Sangha also though has one thing it does at the end of the celebration, it announces, or that person announces rather, what they are going to do for the Sangha. We have a variety of skill sets and people give those skill sets to the Sangha from that point on, not to be taken advantage of, but to, to meld with what we're doing. We have fire chiefs who are Tenzos. We have Navy, Navy veterans who are mindfulness teachers on a federal level. We have special ed teachers who carry this innate ability or this great ability into helping people in recovery. Librarians, Department of Justice retirees. We have a quite an interesting group, just as I was noticing the group there in Atlanta. It was like the tip of the iceberg, Kojo. Uh, as I watched the Zendo 
I noticed a lot of people moving around. Someone might even be sitting in my old seat, my old seat, by, way, by the way, my old cushion, as you walk through the Dharma gate into the Zendo and you turn to your left and walk to the far row, my seat was the second one from the end. When I first started sitting there, the guy to my left was a MARTA bus driver. When we got there for six o'clock morning meditation, he was always there. I never knew if he was going on or coming off work. That didn't really matter whether he was coming or going. He was sitting Zazen. So Sangha. I mentioned a little bit about teaching as well. And our intent is to, through the help of Hojo and my Dharma brothers and sisters, is to develop our practice path over the years as we have the need to do so. So our practice path currently has an outline of going all the way through Shiho, as does the Silent Thunder Order Atlanta Soto Zen Center practice path guide. Uh, yet ours will be somewhat different uh, as I get into the outer uh, ranges of that teaching. At the same time, a lot of that teaching <clears throat> has some influence from the Soto Zen Buddhist Association, particularly the ethics and moral section. And then the third is outreach. I mentioned Boundless Center in that we have found that most of our work is out in the community that is going into the community delivering our sharing opportunities to others. And we find that in several areas. So let me mention those, if I may. Recovery community on Cape Cod is strong. We are involved in the recovery community in terms of at least two ways that I can talk about. One is that um, people within our Sangha come and want to know about um, how we teach Zen. We go out into the recovery communities in terms of different places, meetings. We go into halfway houses. We offer meditation, Zazen teaching, which I have been doing now for five years at both the women and men's. And we're about to start up again at a new uh, co-ed facility. Secondly, we have become more engaged with senior citizens. Our village has 30,000 people, 10,000 of them are 65 or older. So it is our audience. We have two audiences, which we gravitate to and gravitate to us. A week from this coming Monday, we are going to present to well, hopefully a large group, uh, the meaning of Buddhism and Zen. We already teach on Tuesdays there, and the number of people on the roll right now is 28. <clears throat> These are important because it encourages us as a Sangha to be more active. And as I'd mentioned to Hojo, in some ways I feel like a parish priest and I find that fits me well. The other area is the interfaith group of Falmouth, which is made up of 15 different clergy uh, representing 15 different denominations or churches rather and synagogues and uh, sanghas uh, in the area. We're the only sangha. So we will be uh, involved more in that. The congregational church where we now have our zendo uh, is uh, most uh, helpful in this regard. They see themselves as a congregation of the community, a fascinating history of that particular denomination. We will also continue to work with sister sanghas um, and with the Silence Under Order Network um, as we go into 2022. And one of the most important things about that for me is that I will be working 
uh, as requested and needed as a senior teacher in our order. The Abbott's Advisory Council is made up of brown robes. And uh, as a result, um, we have the opportunity to discuss our lineage. Recently, Hojo and I had the opportunity to talk about our lineage with some representatives from the Soto Zen Buddhist Association. I must say that I um, felt in refuge with being with Hojo. It's just the two of us, three of them, two of us, and we chatted. What I came to believe leaving that meeting was a re a reaffirmation of my vows, of the way that I have been taught about the meaning of Mokurai. And as a result of that, uh, I feel much more energized, I guess would be a good way. So for me, for uh, our Thaumathodas and Sangha, for the wayfinding, for the change, all of this comes down to conditions and variables. <clears throat> These conditions and variables arrive at the speed of light and last only fleetingly and merge, transform into something else. Something may have left, something may have arrived. But each moment, as we know in our practice, is a brand new configuration of moment. Founders Month, for me, is a time to remember all of that and a time to be grateful. Gratitude is something we talk about in a general way and appreciation in a general way. But every once in a while, it kind of seeps out. And in Gosho, we say, thank you. So Founders Month for me may be a three gosho bowing month. And as a result of that, I think all of us are served better for it, no matter what change we may be going through at the time. Gosho. I'll be happy to try to answer any questions. Um, Hojo, Fusats, if you wish. Definitely. And uh, Sangha, please, inside the Zendo or online, if you have questions or comments for uh, Sensei Sangha, please come off of mute um, and just start talking your questions and comments. Uh, Sangaku, just a quick note. Thank you so much, as always, for your insight, your wisdom. Uh, it is Founders Month, and we're so uh, grateful to have you um, share your um, information about your Sangha. It always brings things back into to view for us to be able to see the full view of the lineage. And we are so grateful for yourself and Hojo Sensei for continuing to be the spark that that holds that for us all. So uh, we're looking forward to um, continued uh, education and knowledge about that from our senior teachers. But as, with that being said, everyone, um, please welcome your questions, your comments. I'm going to move the, the mic inside so folks here can have an opportunity, but please uh, do share and come off with me. Hojo Sensei, any initial comments? No, I'm looking forward to um, this wonderful talk, I thought. Um, I think uh, Sangak may be giving me a little too much credit. We've had an awful lot of help in doing what we've, what we've done here. Um, literally hundreds, thousands of people have come through the center since our foundation, our incorporation in 1977. We're approaching 50 years in continuous operation. So in that time, I don't know how to do the math, but you would have, you know, literally hundreds of people per month coming through, sometimes the same people coming through again, but if you do the math, you'll see it's, um, you sort of measure our success such as it is by the number of people that we serve. And um, so I think all in all, you know, it's a pretty good track record that we've had. And Sangak was an improvement on the approach and how, what, hap what do you do, you know, when you want to start up a group? 
we have a new startup happening in Birmingham now, and we have them come along from time to time. So fortunately, because of the trails that uh, Songok blazed on the original frontier, <laughs> I plugged my book by accident there. Uh, you know, it's a lot easier to do. It's a lot clearer, and uh, how to avoid the pitfalls has become even more clear over the years. So our, 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 we're the 7-Eleven of Zen, you know, we're a convenience store, one on every corner. We're not the mm -hmm. Walmart, a big monastery that you have to climb the mountain to get to. Uh, so we try to keep that kind of humble perspective in mind as to what we're doing. We're just simply, I think, meeting the demand for Zen. That growth is not itself a value or an objective for us. Yes, get to you. Good morning. Um, Sungok Sensei, uh, could you say a little more about, briefly, how you discuss Kukai and the precepts with new people? Well, I talk about you can do whatever you want as long as you want in our Sangha and never have to take Kukai. Jukai is simply an acknowledgement that you take, a personal acknowledgement that you say, I want to say out loud to the public that I am taking vows in Buddhism. That is a personal decision. A vow is a vow. You make a religious vow, a marital vow. And I would say you make a vow as a member of the federal government and as a, um, in the military. And as you make a vow as a new citizen, so we talk about that, what that means, and then I lay out for them. Each one has a particular learning path starting in February through October with Jukai in November. And um, it is identified primarily through similar things to what we have uh, in somewhat along the disciple line in the Silence Under Order but we have them make sure that they read certain books and that they are able to recite um, our sutras that we use in, in our service and that they have dokusan and that they talk with other people who have taken Jukai. And as a result of this, uh, once they have taken Jukai, uh, I think they have a pretty good understanding of why maybe they did. And, um, up until this, up until this year, by the way, this will be the first year that Hojo hasn't presided. I asked him to preside last year because uh, Moko uh, completed her uh, discipleship training. And um, so this is quite, a, quite something. It is a joyous event for us and um, uh, we, we utilize it well, I hope. Anything more specific, Katsuru? No, that's that's a, a good outline, and I'd be I glad to talk with you for share any of that with you if you wish. Thank you. Now, Katsuru's group in uh, Northern California is the other new startup, but he's not exactly a startup. He was actually a disciple of Matsuoka Roshi back in Long Beach. Bellevue, Bellevue, Washington. Yeah, I'm sorry, Bellevue, Washington. That's Northern California. That's not Northern California. <laughs> Northern California is Southern, is Southern Washington. Yeah. One place some people would like to build a wall. Any takers in the agenda? Again, we, again, we'll have Jukai, actually, this is such a timely um, conversation. We have Jukai next Sunday. Um, and I'm excited to, I'm, I'm hoping I know who the, the person in uh, Falmouth is that I, I'm glad you mentioned that date. So I'm going to try to show up for that person. <laughs> no names mentioned there. But again, any questions in the Zendo? Okay. All right. Don't make us call you out. Thank you. <laughs> newcomers in the Zendo, um, newcomers today, relative newcomers. 
we'd appreciate your questions and see what kind of, um, as a newcomer, what kind of um, questions are coming up for you, impressions and so on. Oh, perfect. <laughs> All perfectly clear. John? Uh, Sun Gog Sun, hey, thank you for your presentation this morning. It was much appreciated. I thought I understood you to say that you're taking a step back uh, in relationship to your Azindo, maybe the possibly the, the teaching leadership. Could you say a little more about that, if that's true, please? Um, John, there, there are a couple of different ways in which uh, you can operate a sitting group or a sangha or a center. And until you have a uh, transmitted priest, you do not have a guiding teacher on site. So once you're transmitted, you become the guiding teacher of the, we continue to use Sangha because we don't have a permanent physical location, although we consider ourselves kind of nomadic in that regard. Practice leader, I was doing uh, everything, essentially. So I was doing everything and teaching too for 10 years, as well as going through my practice path. And also, John, I got older during that time. I have gotten to an age. So uh, three years ago, I announced that I would be stepping down as practice leader uh, if, I, if I became uh, transmitted. So the practice leader who happens to be in my screen just above you, uh, Moko Nancy Sherwood, essentially is the chief operating officer, if you will. She's in charge of, of all of the nuts and bolts, and I'm in charge of the, the teaching, and then we get together on a weekly basis to talk about the integration of those two things. So it is a um, interconnected relationship that we find most helpful. Of course, and is these, two, these two are not interchangeable. Guiding teacher and practice leader are not interchangeable. Guiding teacher refers to a person who has been transmitted and is in the Zendo. You can be a teacher and be given permission to teach, but guiding teacher refers back to the person who has the brown robe, essentially. Practice leader, I have found, is becoming more important to me primarily as I age, but also I think just to do, since we do a lot of outreach, there's a lot of coordination, scheduling, those kind of things. Um, so we, so far, so good. And since we have, um, since they say, are you okay? And um, I'm gonna actually uh, call Mok Moko out. If, uh, can she speak a little bit about that role and transition since it's, you know, it's a new role. Is, is it okay to have her just chat a little bit about that? Thank if you. She <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Fasats and um, Hojo. Always wonderful um, to see you and um, to hear you. And I so appreciate your guidance. And of course, Sensei Sangak. Um, I always learn from you, Sensei, and I appreciate that. Um, I'm just learning the role of practice leader, really, and um, Sensei is guiding me gently. Um, he still does quite a bit as I learn to take more responsibility. Um, and we are learning to work together. Um, I, when I first became practice leader, I discovered I had a job. <laughs> full-time job and I was a little taken aback um, but uh, I'm getting used to it and um, 
I'm growing as a result of this position. Uh, I, uh, I, I watch my ego every time I turn around and uh, which is good for me. And um, I, I do things that I'm not comfortable doing and I have to give up things that I am comfortable doing. And uh, that's okay. Um, we do have, we are expanding our outreach, which I think is uh, what I'm com I am comfortable with that. I, that is a role in which uh, that is a passion, actually a passion for me. And um, so we are going in that direction. Uh, and we're getting better known in the community as a result. Um, I did not know what I was getting into, to tell you the truth. And uh, I stumble, I definitely stumble. And one of the wonderful things that Sangha has taught me, and I, I'll be forever grateful for this, is that um, it's okay to make a mistake. <laughs> like, Mistakes happen often and it's okay. Uh, and that is a huge, huge uh, growth for me. Uh, the other thing that um, I've become very aware of also is the gift of ancestors. Um, I've, uh, I listened to, um, a long time Zen practitioner speak about her um, reciting the ancestors before her transmitted transmission ceremony. And um, she had one of those, uh, I don't know what you call them, those, those moments of clarity maybe, uh, you know, those, those um, I don't know what you call them, those, those out of body experiences at the end of her um, um, reciting the women ancestors. And I have to say that when I'm, I was just with my grandchildren yesterday, two hockey games, freezing later. <laughs> and um, and the, one of my granddaughters just looked exactly like my daughter mm. on the rink. You know, and the transmission of things throughout families. You know, my grand, my grandparents, their grandparents. It's all, it's all the same. It's all the same. And I, when I gave my talk about women ancestors during the retreat, it was like, without Mahapashapati, I may not be here, and you may not be here either. And so the more I learn, the more I learn to appreciate. So thank you so much. Just a quick addition. Uh, Marco also heads the uh, project on women ancestors, which uh, we're going to be doing a special thing on coming up on the 17th, I believe, uh, in our Sangha. So, so certainly those who would like to attend. Thank you, Mokyo, for sharing. And I think uh, this is uh, Fusata in Atlanta. I just wanted to, to say a few comments here, but I really feel like that's the strength of the, the order is that as the affiliates are seated, you know, we learn from each other. It, we learn how that what works and what doesn't work and we share and it's not always easy. And it's just like any family, it can get messy sometimes, but I, I think that's so much um, opportunity in those, like, like you said, Mokyo, it's the, opportunity to make the mistakes and not and lovingly be you know corrected and informed by the decisions that we that we see in in the the feedback so i i am so grateful for falmouth um for really being able to share with us the journey that you have and the progression that you're making and hopefully being able to feed that back to the other affiliates to to be able to share in your strengths and allow us to be able to utilize some of that information in our own practice gosh to both Thank you so much.
Yeah, it should be said for those who don't understand. Sorry, Mokuo, just a, a brief comment. STO was established for that purpose exactly to be a service organization to the affiliate practice leaders. So really, uh, in terms of if you want a hierarchy of management, the Practice Leaders Forum, which is currently headed up by Katsuryu and Bill Cooper, is really sort of the driving force behind STO. The board of directors and all of those of us who serve the larger Sangha uh, are responsive to the practice leaders. So anybody who has any qualms about starting a group or becoming a practice leader, you, we're here to support that effort rather than to tell you how to do it exactly or tell you what you should do. So it's a it's a ground up organization and um, the STO uh, faculty is meant to backstop you in your efforts. So just recently, um, Scott, who's on call tonight, he's in Arkansas. And it turned out that uh, Shorty John Bradley, who was um, in Austin when I was there in 2007 for my ongo with Barbara, Serene Barbara Cohn of the Suzuki Image, uh, uh, Shorty transferred to Okamoto in Bloomington. Mm -hmm. And I was invited to his um, Zaike Tokudo ordination ceremony in that lineage where he took on a new name. We share the Okamura lineage, as most of you know, because he also did my formal ceremonies. But uh, uh, Scott is a lone ranger out there in Arkansas, Little Rock. But as it turns out, Shorty is also uh, north of him and visits a town only 15 minutes or so away. So they're able to meet. They've, all, they've already met. And so Shorty could implement or be part of his training and ceremonies. Uh, Shorty could through the local um, placing of the vestments and so forth, and I could still give the precepts over the um, internet. So our, our model is to take advantage of um, all of the current technology and media in order to make Zazen available, or Zazen practice and Zen practice available uh, on a countrywide basis as, as much as possible. And we, we utilize the network of affiliates, including those in the Okamura lineage, uh, in order to make, make that happen or meet the demand for it. And Mokyo, I saw your hand back up. I'm sorry. Well, I just forgot, forgot a part. <laughs> um, you know, it was really important for me to get to know people in the Silent Thunder Order. And I had two mentors uh, when I was studying for discipleship, which, which was really important. Um, it was Kuasan and Sensei Zenku to be able to talk with them and, and just to get their points of view of things. Um, and just to be able to be on a committee and get to know people and see how they conduct themselves. I think that's really, was really important for me um, the more, the more people I know, or the and the more um, relationships that I have with other people, it's the more helpful it is. So, thank you. I would love a question from someone in Atlanta. Yeah. They could hear some good Atlanta accents we have some yes hello uh thank you so much for this talk and i, I really appreciate learning more about the affiliates and uh, overall the the uh silent thunder order um i'm learning so much this year and i have to say my i i, I perked up to attention when you started discussing the themes of your talk change and leaving home um both of those have been very central to my own life this year just this year i've gotten divorced purchased a house had a child leave home a second child will be leaving home here in about six to eight weeks hopefully 
and I've found this sangha. And next week I I will be taking Jukai. So it's it's just this amazing culmination. I'm so grateful for this sangha and 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 the learning that I'm that I'm having and the return uh, to the cushion after about a five year hiatus. Um, so I I just want to express my gratitude for this theme of leaving home and and I will be holding that close over the next week or so. Gastro. And may I ask your name? Lindy. Hi. Good to meet you and congratulations on Jukai. Just a just a comment on leaving home. It's a teaching. And the, the, the leaving and home don't get confused. What is home is the moment. That's all we have. And when we feel that we are, we are seeing the moment clearly and doing what we think needs to be done, even if it's not easy, there's a certain sense of uprightness in that. So we leave home every moment and go to a new home, which is the next moment. The continuity in this, as you pointed out, is that you can be doing, you can be leaving one place and being in another at the same time. So people are leaving and coming and going, but in our study, we tend to think of Tathagata, is that things don't come and go, our perspectives come and go. And when we have a certain perspective on the idea of coming and going, it changes the meaning of leaving and arriving. So I, I applaud you in coming back after five years and, and uh, hope things go well uh, with uh, Jukai. And uh, thank you for, for commenting. It's worth pointing out that coming and going has traditionally meant living and dying, or the transition from life to death as well. And so the Buddhist attitude is the one that's just been expressed, even including life and death. Die and rebirth on the cushion. I, I can't believe that my Dharma brother, Shikaku, has not been led to speak on Uji since that's one of his favorite things to do. I'm just, you don't have to say anything, but I just have to mention that. <laughs> Chicago. The first year of Zen, uh, four years ago, I had many questions and many things to say, though I have almost no things to say now. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> And again, a quick time check. Uh, we got about 10 minutes and uh, last call for questions. Sure, yeah. It's really here. It's a, you don't, yeah, you could be able to. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Michael. I'm, it's actually my first time coming to a uh, not here, but to Sunday service specifically. Okay. Um, but, and, I, and I appreciate the talk and being able to, to hear, hear these words this morning. Um, and in this talk, we talked a lot about change and respect to the Sangha or, or Zen communities throughout the past years. But I was curious if I could hear a couple words on change outside of these communities. And as a Zen practitioner, confronting change, not just mm -hmm. with our Sangha, but when you're out, unable to have that, I guess, contact with that Sangha, kind of more so on your own, confronting these, these aspects of change. Could you speak up just a little bit? I'm noticing some squinting eyes. These are some old guys here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sounds really good. Yeah. Oh, is it good? Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think I, I think I get the gist of your question. Change outside of the sangha. Change yeah. 
Uh, may I ask you what you think change is? Um, Not types of change, but change itself. Mm -hmm. I guess in, in the larger aspect of, of not just life transformations, but, but aging and, and um, kind of those, I guess, just aging through life um, and everything that comes with, with this um, impermanent quality of life of, of, I guess, in the, in the sense that time always moves on, there's always change, you know, occurring. Well, if that's the case, it's called impermanence. Impermanence and interconnectivity. Interconnectivity, I feel, is something we have to embrace impermanence. In other words, if others hadn't been there before you, they wouldn't be able to say, I too was there. It's like the tombstone that reads, a uh, guy looking at the tombstone that says, as you see me, as you see me, I once was like you, as you are now, you will be like me too. So change impermanence is when looked at through interconnectivity, it has a slightly different meaning. It is not nihilistic. It is simply what is occurring in a moment. And um, from that perspective, I believe we get a sense of continuity. So when we talk about ancestors, essentially we are ancestors in waiting. So as we talk about ancestors, we're talking about um, people that have gone through what you've gone through. And uh, as a result of that, you're looking back at them and learning. In Dead Poet Society, in the movie in particular, there was not, it was not remorseful. It was very, very direct in the sense that change is constantly occurring, which in, and Hojo speaks a little bit to that. If, if change is constant, how is it impermanent? And it's impermanent because it's changing. Change is not the status quo. And then the other thing, and I think this is to your point, um, we say change, change is small or change is medium or change is large, or we have some measure of change. And when we expect something to change in a certain amount or so forth, we get into some issues. But I, I think you're at the right place and are asking the right questions. And as the more time you spend on the cushion, um, be interesting to hear the next time we meet what your question will be. So uh, please continue your practice. Thank you so much. I have a question about What is your sense that it's different outside of the sound of it? I'm sorry. I, would, uh, I have a question about your question. What is your sense that it's different outside of the Sangha? Is it the sense that there's not like an agreed upon set of rules to mitigate change? It's just a free for all? Um, it was more in the sense of uh, less about, I guess, institutional change, but me moving to a different state. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm losing oh, you. Yeah, I can leave you <laughs> um, it, was, it was more or less in regards to yeah. the sense of me moving to a different state or these institutional changes of people coming sure. into this specific Sangha or leaving this specific Sangha unless oriented around that kind of, okay. I guess, communal or institutional aspect, and more okay. of a question of change as in regards to, um, I guess, the self change of um, not our community, but the individual as he's aging or she's aging or the individual as to say, you know, every, every second you are living, but to live, you are getting closer to death. So coming in regards to, yeah, and confronting that kind of change and, and 
how to confront it and how to, I guess, grasp it. The ultimate question is, what is the meaning of birth and death? Great is the meaning of birth and death. First of all, we change our thinking about that through a variety of ways. And we change it uh, constantly. This is called being. Being is going through the moment as it presents itself time after time after time. One variation on the big number that uh, Dogen uses to define uh, moment is that we do that probably 25,000 times a day. We arrive at a moment that is different from the moment we just left. I want to say there is no difference. Change simply is change. It's our perspective, our experience that we've had. The experience that we had have had changes our perception of change. Practice essentially is putting ourselves in the position to expose ourselves to our understanding of self. And then as we go through this process, we come to realize it's not what we think. And we are simply experiencing this time and time again. And when we experience with others in Sangha, or you experience it with friends, or have a sense of loving relationships with other, that is extremely helpful. <clears throat> and we find, for example, that to deal with impermanence, we have to have interconnectivity. The idea of a wedding and a funeral are basically the same. It is a celebration of life. So when we talk about, uh, when you talk about, or I talk about change, that gives us an opportunity to know more about each other and what we mean by that. And kind of like leaning in to, you know, let's talk more about that. Let's, can, can we talk more about that? Um, I remember when, back when I was teaching management, there was a, a phrase a lot of people were using said, the only, the only person that hates change is babies. Infants had something to do with pooping changing time. <laughs> they didn't mind it. We, we, we minded it much more than they did. <clears throat> awesome. Any last call for any questions or comments? Or I will hand it back over to Sensei Sangak for his closing comments or, or thoughts. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, I enjoyed being here this morning. It's a beautiful day on the on the Cape, and to uh, spend some time with you is, is, is most most helpful. So I encourage all of you to use this month well um, as, as a time to think, a time to uh, appreciate, time to be grateful, and as always, uh, continue your practice, and may you be well. Sensei Sangak and the Falmouth Sangha, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to, to commune with you. Um, and your sharing and your wisdom as always, we look forward to uh, our continued efforts and um, we wish you much success in your efforts as you're outreaching and evolving your Sangha. So we look forward to hearing back about your efforts uh, and sharing as well. So a big gosho to Sensei um, and Mukyo. Thank you so much for sharing. Gotcha. And before we, before we close, as always, uh, thank you so much for your presence and your practice. We would not be here without the efforts of our ancestors and of course is uh you contributing to us so as always um if you find value in the things that we do we ask that you consider if, uh, gratitude for those who are already consistent contributors but if you're not we ask that you could maybe consider um doing that as well um we do have upcoming programs next sunday we will be having our juca ceremony uh we will go uh have our normal service and then at 10 30 we will jump right into our uh, Jukai services. There'll be um, information online about that. Those folks that have um, talked to Sensei, Hojo Sensei, and have um, are gonna be initiated, will be more information about that via email next week. And we, as always, have daily practice opportunities um, in our eight morning and evening sits, our book clubs, and again, our Sunday services. So we um, invite you to please um, check out the website, find out more information, as well as, as also our affiliates have uh, programming going on. So please check out that opportunity as well. 
Ojo Sensei, is there anything else that you wanted to mention? No, um, I think we have a pretty good class of 2021. I think we have eight or 10 people. Okay, eight right now. We'll eight, see. Eight people later. signed up. So it should be an interesting ceremony. Awesome. And um, please tune in to uh, welcome the new class if you are not going through Jukai yourself. Mm -hmm. And I see some new people, Jeff, Lizzie, Laura Lee, uh, Joe, Scott. Again, we want to welcome, virtually welcome you as well. Um, we are so glad to see you and hope that you'll continue to uh, come. So welcome. <laughs> and without further ado, what we'll do is do our closing Dharma verses. Um, and I'll bring the bell since I have it. <laughs> and Gasso, everyone, thank you so much. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Beings are numberless, I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible, I vow to end them. Honor gates are boundless, I vow to enter them. The Buddha way is unsurpassable, I vow to realize it. Beings are numberless. I vow to free them, delusions inexhaustible. I vow to end them, Dharma gates boundless. I vow to enter them, the Buddha way unsurpassable. I vow to realize it be numberless. I vow to free them. Illusions are in a I vow to end them. Dharma gates are bound. I vow to enter them. The Buddha way is unsurpassable. I to realize it. I'll show everyone. Happy Founders Month. Thank you. Everybody have a safe uh, rest of the day. Enjoy the beautiful day outside. Gotcha, everyone. Stick in a couple of things.